Hi, welcome to The Witch in the Woods and we're turning towards Samhain which is the time that our Celtic ancestors considered a new year. I've got a dry throat so here we go, let's celebrate with this nice glass of sticky ginger wine. Mm. And what else is there to do when the night's drawing in? But huddle by the fire and drink and tell stories. And this is what our ancestors would have done. They would have told stories about the dead and the supernatural beings, the gods, the goddesses, and of course the elves. So in this episode I want to discuss a little more about who are the elves, who are considered the ancestors, the ancestors of the dead, and how they relate to our mythology, specifically to the idea that the dead remain sleeping in the other world, which was often considered to be in barrow mounds or under the hills. So if you imagine those long winter nights, there was really not a lot else to do but sit by the fire and stay warm and tell stories in the dark without electric lights. You couldn't really do anything. And so this time was a great time for delving into the deep world of myths and stories and the subconscious. And um, it relates to very much the world of the dead and the world of the ancestors. So in this video I want to discuss the role of King Arthur. Now you may wonder why I'm choosing Arthur to talk about Samhain, but I think Arthur is very inextricably linked to our ideas of the underworld and the ideas of fairy and um, the magical world of Celtic mythology. So I want to look at Arthur's role as the sleeping hero um, or other, as he's otherwise known as the king sleeping in the mountain. visiting Barbrook Circle I um, I started reworking a picture I began a long time ago and I've actually been awake till about 4am this morning when the first birds sang really beautifully um, and I was uh, just working this over with a bit of biro. Uh, it's evolved from something I got stuck on which is trying to uh, show a barrow elf, a barrow fairy mound being um, and I added a few ideas to it last night such as the idea of the sleeping king um, and Arthur himself of course he was connected to the bear um, and how the sleeping king is sort of a symbol of coming out So I started this a while ago, I began just drawing, pencil drawing, trying to get the right kind of face.
kind of elf being I saw more associated with um, Arthur and with the Simple Fair. elf being of the deep dark glens of the wilds. The symbol of him emerging from Barrow Mound um, and related to appearing in stone circles and around magical landscapes. which is Arthur turned stone um, and a kind of Christian more medieval He's all these things Can you hear the foxes barking? So it can. It's getting time to celebrate Samhain, which as we know is the great Celtic feast of the dead and the beginning of the new year. So I will raise a glass to the ancestors and if I'm slurring my speech a little it's because this is take two and I've already drunk quite a lot of this quite strong wine. Oh. And what I want to talk about is the Celtic worship of the ancestors and how that relates to the beings who were said to dwell in Barrow Mounds, who we can see as the great sleeping king. Now most famously this king can be seen as King Arthur, who is said to be not dead but sleeping to be called upon in times of need. But it also led me to believe 
What other kings are buried in barrow mounds that are only sleeping to be called upon? Perhaps the great king who was buried at Sudden Who was only sleeping, wrapped in fine clothing, surrounded by all the trappings of his, you know, mortal life. Perhaps that's the burial rites of our ancestors to believe that when we buried these people they were still there in an afterlife situation only waiting to be called upon to help us, to give us advice. And the idea that Barrow Mounds can be woken, Barrow Beings can be woken to give guidance um, led me into quite a train of thought. So. This video has taken some time to complete and part of what I wanted to incorporate in this was some creative work that I started way back when in the middle of summer. Now, um, I'm not a great artist but I find that it's a great way to explore what's going on creatively and within your psyche and intuitively. So that's why I'm going to include that in this video. Um, and what I did was I went to visit the stone circles up on top of Derbyshire. And I kind of was really drawn to the cairns there and to the barrow mounds. And I wondered what exactly, what rituals had taken place when our ancestors had buried their dead because they had buried quite a lot of them with items for daily life, for daily living. Perhaps they believed that they would need them in the next life, or perhaps they believed that they weren't really dead, that they were in some suspended state of animation as a spirit. So that brought me on to the subject of this video, which was looking into the classic fairy tale that is called The Sleeping Hero, or The, Ke the King Who Sleeps Under the Mountain. Now this is an Anne Thompson classification of fairy tales, which means that it's a common theme that occurs again and again. And this story goes, there is a king who is not dead, but only sleeping and he waits to be awakened in times of need. Now, in the Grimm's version of this fairy tale, a traveller stumbles into a cave where he wakes the sleeping king. The king asks him, do the ravens still fly over the mountain top? To which the traveller replies, yes, yes they do. And the sleeping king replies, well, well then my time has not yet come and you have woken me too early. So the traveller then leaves the cave but sometimes in these tales he has aged immeasurably while he was there. So the connection with these kings seems to be to a totem and this totem would seem to be ravens. Sometimes it is eagles. But the time of danger is only perceived when the ravens have stopped flying over the mountain. Now this leads us on to the story of Bran. Um, as you may know, Bran's head is buried under the Tower of London. And the Tower of London must always have ravens. When the ravens leave, then the country is in peril. So let's look into this story of Bran the Blessed. Now the name Bran means the crow or, or the raven. They were pretty much the same um, in Celtic thought. And he had a cauldron. And in this cauldron you could throw slain warriors and they would become reborn. So there is some idea of reincarnation in this cauldron that Bran owned. 
Now, it's cutting a long story short, but Bran was mortally wounded in a battle when he received a wound in his foot. So he asked his retainers to chop off his head and take it to the White Hill in London and to bury it there facing France where it would always guard the country from invasion and danger. Now there were only seven retainers who survived this battle and they did as he asked, they chopped off his head but they fell under a kind of spell and they instead spent seven years feasting in a hall in Harlech having forgotten everything of what they were asked. But while they were feasting the head of a brown actually entertained them with as much wit and humour as if he was still alive. And so they were entertained by Bran for seven years until one day one of them opened a door that faced towards Swansea or Cardiff and when this door was opened all the sorrow of their mortal life flooded back in and they remembered their mission and so it was that they spent seven years feasting before they actually took the head and buried it in the White Hill. Now this story of a head entertaining them and lots of feasting actually refers to some concept of the life in the other world, in the world after death. Um, now it was said in the Welsh triads that Arthur actually dug up the head of Bran and the reason for this was that he should be the only one who should protect England. But actually Bran carried on in the mythology and he carried on as the Fisher King. And so as we know the Fisher King is a king who is mortally wounded in the leg but he cannot die and so he spends his time living an eternity in a feasting hall and he can only be saved by the Holy Grail. So a drink from the Holy Grail is the only thing that would end the Fish King's suffering. Now in many tales uh, they call this Fisher King Bron and this is perhaps a continuation of the god Bran. In the tale of Perigur, the Perigur enters the feasting hall but he finds there not a king but a severed head. Now this head related to the sleeping king, to the king who will not die and to the king who protects the land of Britain may actually relate to ancient tales of Celtic head worship. Now it is known that the Celts would worship the skull and they would often take the skull of their enemies. Now Strabo tells us that they would pickle this skull in cedar oil and preserve it and they would keep these skulls on display. Um, it was told by Livy that there was a Celtic warrior called Bowie who killed a Roman um, prefect and actually used his skull as a drinking cup and he covered it in gold. So these are the tales we have of the Celtic skull worship, the Celtic um, cult of the head it was called. And so all of these tales seem to relate back to an ancient Celtic um, ancestral religion relating to the wisdom and knowledge that is retained in the skull after death. So the idea is that the skull contains the soul it also contains the wisdom of that individual. 
Um, and so when we look at the stories of the Sleeping King, we can see that this is very much related to keeping the skulls of the ancestors in order to be able to refer to them in times of need. I'm just going to have a sip because that was heavy going. So these severed heads appear in many Celtic myths and they seem to occur amongst feasting. Um, and while they are feasted, they give out their wisdom, their secrets and their prophecies. Now, when we look at the Arthurian legend, we also find the story of Gawain and the Green Knight. And here, the Green Knight challenges somebody to come and meet him in combat once a year. So Gawain takes up the offer and what he does is he cuts off the Green Knight's head but he finds that the Green Knight cannot be killed by cutting off his head. In fact the Green Knight picks up his head and walks away with it. Um, so this mythical and otherworldly being has such power that he can retain his life force through retaining his head and beheading him does not actually destroy him, it only makes him stronger. Severed heads are also associated with many sacred wells and these Celtic wells can be found quite a lot um, in the north of England and in Scotland and right up until the 18th, 19th century in Scotland you will find the well of seven heads and above this well is a monument on which are seven heads. Now there's a long story relating to this history, but it would seem to go back to the Celtic head worship. Now recently I was in Castleton in Edale and I saw in the visitor centre there a stone which was found by a sacred well, which was a carving of a head. And it was presumed that this carving was of a Celtic god. There are also other wells um, dotted throughout North Yorkshire, anywhere west of sort of um, West Yorkshire, um, going up the country, um, anywhere that was Brigantian country. There are quite a few wells that have severed heads or heads. Um, motifs around them so they were built into walls some were buried in the wells and so it would seem that these heads were also associated with wells so wells represent the well of memory and this appears in many fairy tales too there is a I think it's a Grimm's fairy tale that is called um, the head in the well where a young girl goes to seek advice and she must find a well and in this well she finds a head and the head tells her to wash me and comb me and lay me down softly and then this head tells her everything she needs to know to go about and complete her task. There's also the Norse myth of Mimir and Mimir is beheaded in the war between the Ozir and the Vanir and of course it is to Mimir's head that Odin refers for wisdom so Odin keeps this head and travels around with it and the head tells him secrets, it tells him prophecies, it tells him oracles and so Odin keeps this head as a source of wisdom. And so when we look at deeper myths of ancestor worship, burying our ancestors in mounds and um, keeping their heads, keeping their, their skeletons, keeping their skulls alive. This seems to be um, some kind of myth relating to being able to wake up these beings and ask them wisdom from the other world. So the Celts saw these supernatural races as living in the other world. But this other world could be accessed through entering into a barrow mound or entering into a cave or entering into a mountain. It could also be accessed by travelling over water 
or travelling through water. And this, of course, is also one of the two tales of Arthur's death. One is that he was taken over the water to Avalon, and the other is that he is sleeping in a castle with his retainers, and that he need only be woken when the country is in times of need. So this is very much the same kind of mythology as Bran, who is sleeping under the White Hill in London, who also can be woken in times of need. So the ancestors were very important to the Celts, and Caesar tells us that the Gauls believed that they all came from one great source, one progenitor. And this source was actually the underworld god of the dead. Now when we look at this, we wonder how every being could come from the god of the dead. But the truth is that the Celts greatly believed in reincarnation. And so they were all born from the cauldron of rebirth. They were all related to this Celtic underworld god of the dead. So Arthur would seem to be one of the many great kings and these kings were considered to be real kings who could never die. So this story is told about many beings. The story has been told about Charlemagne. It has been told about Harold, the King of England. It has been told about Francis Drake. And of course it has been told about Arthur and Merlin. Now, the rest of these beings were real warriors, real people. Um, and this myth seems to be attached to a great hero who actually lived. So, I would like to think by association that there is some possibility that King Arthur actually lived and was a real 6th century king. So he and other famous heroes throughout time have become sleeping warriors and through their rites of burial these great beings have not died, have not passed on into some distant heaven but are living side by side and need only to be woken to pass on their secrets, to pass on their strength whenever there is a great time of need. So, the next time you carve a pumpkin for Halloween, please bear in mind that what you are referring to is the great skull of the ancestor, which is a source of infinite wisdom, a source of deep underworld, power and connection to all that is. So I hope you enjoyed this video and I hope that you've enjoyed the creativity that went along with it. Thank you for listening and I hope to speak to you all again soon. Cheers, bye.